that the lacking goal of Tecton is not the full pursuit of knowledge for the benefit of the entire country. Why is it that scholars in private universities are not deemed qualified to compete for and draw from this national force, even though their universities have been granted licenses to operate by Nigerian University Commission and have regularly been held to high standards through the regular accreditation review process? No nation, no nation, I repeat, can aspire to greatness by deliberately discriminating against citizens who have legitimately and legally invested their resources in the promotion of knowledge for the benefit of the nation. Second, in the absence of a nationally competitive program for rewarding academic excellence, Nigeria will need not with its full academic potential, Nigeria currently lacks state-based organizations like the American Social Science Research Council, National Humanities Foundation, institutions created to encourage the spirit of competition among junior and senior scholars to pursue research that benefits the community and the society at large. So the establishment of similar organizations in Nigeria who provide forum for identifying the best and the brightest institutions and scholars, encouraging them in a common quest for excellence in higher education. On several occasions, I have taken advantage of my membership of the Nigerian National Order of Merits, NNON, to suggest that we spearhead such a body the National Endowment Fellowship for the Humanities, Natural and Medical Sciences, and in Technology in order to encourage research through this competitive process. Indeed, I went so far as to suggest that such a body could help generate close to 1,000 fellowships a year. These fellowships could be distributed across the country to worthy scholars, particularly those who qualify for sabbatical leaves, which would also solve the problem of senior scholars having to scout for teaching positions during their sabbatical years. Ladies and gentlemen, all over the world, sabbatical leaves are not meant for going another place to teach. They're meant for research. But if they don't have the money to do research, what do you want them to do? They have to go and look at teaching position in other places. It is wrong, and we must create the avenue for our scholars to be able to do what to spend their sabbatical leave in peace and you know. Right now, I'm on sabbatical leave from Harvard. I'll be free till August uh, uh, this year, and I'm supposed to be doing some research. In principle, I am not allowed to go to another university and be teaching. It's the free time to do your work so that you can publish. After all, it's easily published your parents, Mr. Pastor. Where do them go to your public? If you don't give them the time to do the research and to, you know, and to do the work. Tell me. That's what. Private bodies are missed listening to me for the benefit of our fathers and our sisters who are here. This is meant for you. Private bodies, particularly businesses and philanthropists, must respond to the challenge of creating new foundations for rewarding excellence in institutions of higher learning. I know that Nigerians have the means to create such foundations. Possible models could be the John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship in the United States, which I was honored to, to have, the MacArthur Fellowship, nicknamed the Dean of Award, and of course, the Nobel Prize, which is awarded annually in Austin, all of which are considered prestigious by American and European universities. At the University of California, where I was for 16 years, as you just asked, receiving one of these three prizes will place you at the topmost rank of the university system and of your academic field. Grants and fellowships like this open doors 
and opportunities for greater recognition in the academy. It was when I got the Googling app, and I was granted a whole automatic one year thing at the university for getting the Googling app because to bring prestige and honor to your university, that all these doors started opening. They were the one writing me and said, Are you interested in this? So we do have philanthropists. We do have those who have the money who can do what? Create a legacy for themselves by creating foundations. And you know, come on, come to us, come to your vice chancellor, come to your district to address you on how to create it. What is the purpose of having billions of, of naira, millions of dollars in a kind? And then you die. That is the end of it. Please, let's think about it. Because I believe that this may be one way to solve this problem. Therefore, my fellow citizens, my beloved friends and colleagues, this nation should state boldly and unequivocally that Nigerians, both in private and public sectors, have the means, the zeal, and the commitment to make this nation great in higher education. If only we can pay the necessary attention to this matter. Why do Nigerians and Africans in general think that they are not destined to be creators of world class innovative programs and projects that will originate from our community and travel to other lands with significant success? Many of us have been wondering why Nigeria is almost at the bottom of the world academic totem pole. Whenever statistics for university performances around the globe are public, we wonder why the oldest of our universities, such as the Badan, Unsuka, Ife, and Montevideo institutions, that served as important centers of excellence at the time of independence in the 1960s and attracted many, many intellectuals, scholars, and students from around the world who study in Nigeria on, have been go. unable to reach the heights and the stage by their founding fathers. Let me repeat it. At the time of this, at the university, the cost of white people came to this country to study. They then became the experts in Africa, in different places. They are now close to retiring age in their 70s and 75. So what is it? Why is it that we are not able to do that today? This is the question I am asking. And this is where we need to think about this is a crisis. We are in a crisis, and we must admit that. Because the same Nigerians abroad are doing their best. The most difficult operations in medicine, in surgery, are, are done by Nigerians, uh, doctors abroad. So what is the problem? This is why I am raising this and I'm doing it in uh, it is like uh, it's like uh, the prophet, you know, the difference between the Medina Surah and the Mecca Surah is very clear. You know, the Mecca Surah is important for the prophet to be very forceful about the social revolution he wanted to perform. And then, of course, you go to Medina, trade in the city, the city of the prophet, and be more relaxed. This is not the time for us to be relaxed about our status. And this is why I am worried about what is going on. So when one considers these historical places of learning, and even the second generation universities that came after them, such as the University of Lagos, the University of Benin, the University of uh, Bayoro University, and the University of Calabar, we are reminded of the greatness that characterized these institutions in the past. Like the faded memories reminding us of the greatness of African Lumbian Empire of the medieval period. Another such as Mali and Ashante and Tonge, which attracted scholars from the Mediterranean region who wanted to see and to experience firsthand the intellectual vibrancy of this great empire. So are the status of this once preeminent barbarian place. What then can we do to bring back the glorious past, particularly at this critical period? We must recognize that we are not the first to ask ourselves this question. Nigeria must not think that we are the only one. Other countries face similar problems before us. 
In this quad mire, nations such as India, South Africa, China, and South Africa have asked similar questions in the past. These nations look both inward and outward for solutions. One of the initiatives that helped to revitalize the educational system in these countries was the creation of independent research professorship and the development of centers of educational excellence. These involve calling on diaspora academics to establish international programs that stimulate academic excellence within their home nations. How did they do it? That's the question, the next question I want I would like to ask. India and China, partly through their diaspora, have invigorated the educational system at home. A sizable number of Chinese uh, scholars abroad, for example, particularly those of them in Europe and the United States, have become transnational figures, juggling between their foreign homelands and their ancestral homes. Over the past 20 years, I've visited Chinese universities and have been I've seen how rigorous academic programs and initiatives are transported from elsewhere to create centers of learning that connect young students at home to academic centers of excellence abroad. Universities such as Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Syracuse, to mention just a few, produce some of these young these scholars I'm talking about. They were not the most tired in those universities. They were just above average. But their country gave them the opportunity to come and help at home, to come and help in partnership with those who are, you know, who are here. Nigeria has not followed this model. One reason is because we are still a nation where a prophet has no honor in his own town. <laughs> Let me look on as an exception, right? I always like you, and I believe, and I can confirm it, that if a homeless white person, I'm sorry to, you know, uh, raise this, but it's very important, dresses in a three-piece suit and travels to Nigeria in the same plane with a Nigerian professor from Cambridge University, it is very likely that the way dressed homeless American will receive a more dignified welcome and salute than the simply dressed Nigerian professor who teaches at Cambridge. I know quantum university is not included. <laughs> we have internalized our own oppression and have developed a kind of colonial mindset, one that associates success with being modern and associating with white people. We all suffer from that. This mindset allows Nigerians to denigrate their own people. It is a psychological form of inferiority, a complex, one that we must reckon with in order to make a success of our country. This is very painful for Nigerians and Africans who are abroad, who know that the people they are dealing with already recognize them as brains, as intellectuals. So then they wonder when they come to their own country, Uganda, Nigeria, uh, Ghana, why do they treat them as if they are just non-entities? Some of the brightest and best Nigerian professionals have mentioned are scholars who are living abroad. They continue to make their home states the best in the world. So it requires them developing a sense of national unity that goes beyond the primordial ethnic cleverages and building the capacity of the states to fulfill social and economic roles in the affairs of the country. And let me state, we must realize the potential of the expertise of the Nigerian diaspora, and we must integrate them with the homegrown Nigerian professionals and scholars, as it is this kind of mutual interplay that has contributed to the rapid development of Korea, China, and India, who at various points in their history face some of the kinds of issues we face today. I must emphasize that the diaspora and the Nigerians doing work in other places matter significantly to the task ahead of us. In Nigeria, remittances coming into this country from the diaspora, we are told, has surpassed oil revenues which shows that diaspora resources in terms of human capital, finances, 
education and health truly make an impact. So we must take the diaspora seriously and incorporate its energy into our national building project. Uh, unfortunately, the current situation doesn't support that. It doesn't suggest that this is what we are doing. Let me quickly go to what I call the university reforms and the quest for excellence. Our educational reform must begin by engaging the needs of Nigerian students at home and abroad. One of the major concerns of these students is the quality of Nigerian universities and the lack of dignity afforded to students who are often struggling, who are the already uh, uh, scarce resources uh, available, uh, available uh, to them. Students must also feel comfortable enough to challenge the assumptions and research of their professors. A school first student but they cannot advance Nigerian intellectual creativity. We must strive for more open discussion of issues of contemporary importance. Welcome, Mr. Chancellor. Students must also feel comfortable enough to challenge the assumptions and research of their professors. A school first student body cannot advance Nigerian intellectual activity. We must try for more open discussion of issues of contemporary importance in the classroom that ensure that the classroom experience reflects and educates students on the real side. In addition to the uh, National University Commissions, we should develop regional uh, NBC should re re develop regional centers that will monitor policies on education more closely. I am aware that some of the students are learning under the atmosphere of fear. And if I'm wrong, they are very creative students. And we must engage them in ways that will get out the creativity in them. In, in, in my own situation, and I hate in referring to America, by the time they finish their first degree, they are masters of the business. I can sit in the office and ask a, you know, a graduate student uh, uh, in fourth year of the graduate, that, oh, I need to send the letter to six people, and I'll just be dictating. And, and it will take the thing again and edit it and send it to me. The letter is ready to go. Then I know it's ready to enter the world. So we must change this system. And this is why I'm recommending that NUC cannot just sit in Abuja. It's a lot of work. And I have a lot of respect for, uh, uh, for uh, our colleague who is there. He's a fine scholar. I've known him for a long time. We must create centers, NUC regional centers, in different places, so that they will be able to know what is going on and monitor the activities in our different regions. You go to one remote area in the southeast or somewhere, you see a sign for pointing to Harvard University, and then you say Harvard University, where are you? And if you go there too, you see the signs of somebody running his own university and calling the other. So this is part of the problem. So NUC must be willing to move beyond that and to say we need to monitor the educational system so that we can begin to make more progress. Let me move to internationalizing our universities. What makes a university in the 21st century truly international? What makes academic institutions globally relevant? I want to raise this because it's very different from what I said earlier on. The meaning of internationalization has shifted from what it used to be, what it was about 20 years ago, when it signified how many expatriates, whether students or scholars, were privileged to learn and teach in a university at home. 
As we have mentioned earlier, this was how universities of Ibadan, Makerere, uh, Nairobi, South Africa became world known centers of education. Several of the notable European and American professors of African studies came and studied there and they excel. What internationalization means today, however, ranges from how broad the curricula and program in the universities are to how much they are able to embrace transnational and global values and norms. Internationalization means raising the standard of learning, discourse, and teaching to where students are competitively able to compare and compare and convert on a national and global scale with others within the same discipline. So a student of history here will be able to compare with a student of history at Cambridge or Oxford University, if we are known. This way, internationalization is so central and a cardinal in the pursuit of knowledge today. Internationalized universities are engaged in cutting edge research in all the fields of learning, including science, technology, humanities, and social sciences. How many Nigerian universities engage in the pursuit of issues of global importance, such as research, global warming, poverty alleviation, sustainability, social, economic, and cultural development? How often do our students, both undergraduate and postgraduate, have access to membership in international students' club and girls? How many of our students are engaged in improving the conditions of the world that is our common home? We must engage.